morning. <clears throat> just woke up and I have this new thing that I have now is that I like to wake up and record my thoughts because apparently early morning when you wake up is when you have the clearest, most precise, most awakened thoughts in the day and um, I actually like to turn on my my YouTube and see what's interesting and what I found was this. this is Throw stones, we're in glass houses, you know? And that's what I would say. I think that it's unfortunate what's happening over there, but I like to take care of home first. And I think that it's unfortunate what's happening in the United States as well. Um, we are slipping down the same road. Uh, it's unfortunate. It should not be happening, by the way. We literally we, we fought against this. I would also say uh, the article is fundamentally wrong about one thing, historically speaking. The U.S. Revolution was not fought over the freedom of the press. It was a part of it. Um, the free freedom of the press, the right of the people to freely express themselves. These were all of import. Uh, the, the right to be represented, uh, for example, in Parliament. Um, the founders had, had sent people over to simply bitch and, and grieve about the fact that, hey, you know, you're taxing us the same way you do people in Britain, but we've got completely different economic circumstances, number one. And number two, <laughs> you won't even let us put anyone in Parliament. This was of import. You had taxes on tea. You have the Boston Tea Party, for example, and things of that nature. Most American students have been told that that's the reason the revolution was fought. It was over tea. That's not ex exactly the case. And it was over guns, actually, more than anything else. Um, the first shots were fired, ostensibly, because the British regulars, which were part of the government at the time, showed up and tried to confiscate an armory. That's, that's effectively the reason. Um, the UK, though, has abandoned uh, basic human liberty at this point. When you're telling people they can't even have a pocket knife, when you're telling people they're not allowed to speak out against what they believe uh, is, is, is an abuse of some sort, when they're not allowed to weigh in on government policies, except in a way that the government happens to condone, um, then you don't really have free expression at all now, do you? Um, you don't have it in any meaningful way, shape, or form. You're allowed to express your opinions as long as your opinions happen to coincide with the government that's reigning at the time. We've seen this before. We saw this in Nazi Germany. You're free to vote as long as you vote ja. Uh, that, it's the same thing. It's a, basically a Hitler mode or something like that. It doesn't make any sense. The British, uh, you know, they, they fight for years uh, to maintain their freedom and then they take it away from their own citizenry. Um, I, I would say that that's a little bit on the problematic side now, wouldn't you? That's about all. Peace out. So, let's, let's just get something very clear. Uh, World War One, World War II. Not Have you ever wanted untold magical powers, but studying for them sounds way too nerdy for you? Not interests of... All right. Youth of Premium. Fought for the interests of the elite, who benefited enormously from the uh, monetary gain uh, from the exchange of territories and resources. So, the idea that we fight wars for the benefit of the common man is just uh, wrong headed. Uh, wars are fought for the benefit of a few, of a few, usually less than a dozen people. Who really benefits from war? Certainly not the common man. Certainly not the common man. So, um, and they convince you to go to war. To save your democracy or to fight, uh, you know, drug cartels or to whatever the cause may be, you're not really going to war for that. You're going to war to benefit a group of people that will benefit from the violence. 
usually that group of people is very small. And if you don't know who they are, you're in trouble because you're fighting for, um, for ghosts. You're fighting for ghosts. For hungry ghosts that feed on your fantasy. So kudos to the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses who are not willing to fight for anybody. Uh, let's take a look at Chutney. What does Chutney got to say? Es YouTube sin anuncios y la app YouTube Music combinados. Hello everyone, my name is Luna and I'm here to catch you up on everything that happened in episode 104 of Campaign 3 of Critical Role, The Cradle's Convocation. I'm so sorry that my recaps have been a little delayed. Life kind of got in the way. Life needs things to live. But my episode 105 recap will be out early next week and then I should be back on a regular schedule, hopefully. Okay, let's get into it. As Bell's Hells enters into the sanctuary, the forum continues their discussion about how to deal with the Ruby Vanguard. There are lots of people yelling at each other with different opinions, with a large concern being the possibility of another calamity, that the gods may destroy the Divine Gate and go to war again to deal with Predathos. After lots of back and forth, Keyleth loses patience with all of this arguing. We've many of our finest who have been out in the field battling vanguard powers, gathering intel on their movements, seeking answers in the frozen ruins of Isilcross as of late. Yet our attempts to scramble through Ludinus's long-plotted chaos keeps us on the back foot. Even now we've lost our footholds in the Hellcatch and many lives along with them, waiting for you all to get your shit together! Using some water, she forms a vision of the assault in the Hellcatch Valley, which shows that the landscape itself is being raised up somehow to form stone walls and towers, a fortress around- Here's what's the cutest thing in the world. Just look at that. Feline cuteness. So I have more cats. So that's uh, that's the um, the uh, that, that's the high countries. It's um, Norway, Finland, Denmark, and Belgium. That's their names and. Uh, Nice looking cats. Back to Under the Malleus Key. It's unclear what power is doing this, but it is clear that the Vanguard is behind it. Various faction leaders begin pledging their support for an attack on the Malleus Key and potentially Ruidus itself. Allura reminds the Assembly that there are innocent people on Ruidus, and Laudna shares what Bell's Hurls learned of the different peoples living there. Aram encourages the Forum to become allies with those on Ruidus who are being negatively affected by the Vanguard and also the Weave Mind, and Eva Roa, the Bormodo from Ruidus who was forced to work for Ludinus, takes the floor to share an impassioned plea for her people. The vast majority of our people only wish to be left alone. <laughs> And maybe one day walk the golden fields and swim the crystal waters of your world. When out from under the, the weave mind sub subjection, we, we can be kind, beautiful even. Bell's Hills shares some of what they learned in AR and the forum adjourns for the day to discuss this new information and will reconvene the next day. As the forum is dispersing, Laudna asks what kind of security is in place given that this would be the perfect place to assassinate every world leader at once, but Allura assures her there are many measures in place, including the presence of- You guys want to see the greatest thing I've ever done in my life? It's called mayonnaise. I kind of like to eat it right out of the jar. Mm. Now, that takes a really white person to do that, so I can put myself a really white person when I do that. ...of three dragons, one on the roof and two incognito in the chamber. Grog also chimes in, telling them not to worry since he has protected the city in the past, including defeating the Earth Titan in the middle of the city. Yeah. That thing up there, a big old one. Yeah, I did that. Wow. You did that. All by yourself. One v one. More or less. 
<laughs> I believe him. <laughs> he then shows off his Titan stone knuckles, and Fern, intrigued, asks to take a look at them. As he holds them to her face, they begin to glow and heat up as they interact with the shard of a fire titan inside of her, so he pulls them away. He then officially introduces himself to the group. Grand Poobah, the Dying Gold is that one of the masters of Whitestone. Um, kind of a big deal. Legendary warrior from Vox Machina. Oh, yes. Gregory Stronger. <laughs> Pike appears chastising Grog for drinking before the meeting and introduces herself to Breus and Dorian. Vex also joins the group asking where FCG is and Imogen tells her of his sacrifice. Chetney is quite smitten with Vex. <laughs> oh darling, even if I was single, you couldn't afford me. <gasps> wow. She's so cool. And Laudna reveals to her that Delilah is trapped, hopefully permanently. <laughs> Oh, I love this. Vex asks if Laudna can talk to Delilah and make her eat bad foods. Laudna takes a moment to look inward to see if it is possible and sees Delilah chained to a wall, seething with anger. She asks Delilah what her least favourite food is, but Delilah just threatens Laudna, who decides that it will be unseasoned beans for eternity. I'm still figuring it out. Mm. All I'm saying, darling, is make her hurt. <laughs> mm. <sighs> well, that's lovely. That's amazing. After the forum meeting, Keyleth escorts them to a place of the Wild Mother, one of the few places she feels comfortable in Vasselheim. After Fern asks her why she's uncomfortable and kind of almost angry here, Keyleth shares that she struggles with the bureaucracy of the temples and that while there are some good people doing good things, there are others who use their power and influence to their own benefit despite the tenets of their faith. They arrive at the Birth Heart, a beautiful forest filled with glowing blooms and lanterns and enormous trees, including one giant one at the center, the Birth Heart itself. In this sanctuary, Bell's Hell shares more specific details with Keyleth about what they saw of the gods in Aeor, and they discuss what impact this knowledge could have on the general populace and the heads of the temples. Chetney asks if the gods have directly communicated with the heads of their temples, and Keyleth says that they have communed, but of course the only people who know what was said during that communion are the people who were communed with, the temple leaders themselves. Ashton thinks that it's time for the gods to stop being so vague and that they should be having a direct conversation with them, and other members of the group agree that they're sort of tired of constantly reaching out and getting only sort of vague gestures in response. And then they discuss, you know, is it even possible to talk directly with a god when Keyleth shares that she actually herself has done it. She speaks mostly about the Matron of Ravens, who she met because someone in her adventuring party was very close to her. Are you talking about that feathered one? Um. They got turned into a little marble. Oh, well, just trapped for forever. Yeah, no. marble what? Name. Sorry. Don't give... What? I was just curious. Keith. What? what? Sorry. Keith steps towards you. Oh, it's my character. I can bully no. her if I want to. <laughs> 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 the greatest loss I've ever suffered, and the deepest wound I still bear to this day is because of her. She took from me the most important thing I have and will ever know. So yes, she is complicated, and he is gone, and he is in pain, and he is in that tower, in that bridge, Mm. And we will destroy it, and we will stop this. Yes, we will. She talks a little about why she and her adventuring group met the gods, explaining that they needed help crafting artifacts to trap the newly ascended god Vecna, and the gods provided materials to help with those artifacts. The group then discuss with her the morality of the gods and what happens after someone dies. Oren remembers with a high history check that the stories say that before the gods arrived, the landscape was a tumultuous one, but it did still contain life. Jungles and deserts and mountains. Before the gods arrived, souls upon their death would be reborn into Maybe not so useful, but certainly for me, fun. So, is it wasteful? Is it foolish? Is it is it a, a, a lack of meditation? Is it being programmed even? Or is it really just the God in me, the God part of me, expressing one more form of 
to a new body, and it was the gods who created an afterlife for the souls of their most devout followers once they arrived to Exandria. As they are speaking of all of these facets of the gods, Orem's sword begins to glow, and the vines that grow around it begin to reach out to the giant tree. Orem places the tip of the sword to the tree's trunk, and vines and flowers begin to grow all around him, completely surrounding him. Orem finds himself inside a giant flower, or maybe it's just that he is My my morning reading is here, so I'm going to take care of that. Thanks for coming, and I'll see you in the next... Uh,